Okay, welcome everyone. Just give it a couple of minutes so everyone can join. That's no problem. Just a couple more minutes. Okay, we've got 31 people in the room at the minute. Just gonna wait a little bit longer. I'm the person that just asked to unmute, we're currently working loud and clear, so I check your speakers on your side. Okay, we're 33 people currently. I think that's a good point to start everyone. It seems to be cons pretty consistent on the numbers. And um, obviously welcome everyone to today's event for Green Surface Engineering. This is the Surface Engineering Protection Limited jointly with the Surface Engineering Association event. And um, I'm gonna quickly run you through our pre-event slides. Um, just to give an introduction to the IET and what we're all about. And then I'm going to hand over, obviously, to the gents running the presentation. Um, so, again, welcome everyone to the Merseyside and Western Cheshire Local Network um, online webinar event for the Manufacturing and Management Group. Um, obviously, what we are today is obviously we want to aim to share engineering success and innovation within the local network in our local community. Obviously, to raise the importance of design, manufacturing, management, and their integration of as professional engineers within the Merseyside and Western Cheshire area. And we do this through a range of events, obviously, to promote novel technologies, techniques, um, and best practice with all of the wonderful businesses within our local area. Um, obviously, we are made up of local network committees with a range of technical groups. This is the obviously start with the school liaison officers, young professionals, biomedical engineering groups, and obviously a, a range of others. And um, that is predominantly made up of volunteers, and we all give up our free time to put on these events to ensure that we continue to develop as, as a community, as en professional engineers, and support engineering within the local network and the Merseyside and Western Chester region. Um, obviously, the main activities for us is obviously technical visits in company to companies, presentations, seminars, recognition events. Um, we do usually host an annual dinner, but obviously COVID hasn't um, allowed us to do this in recent years. And event newsletters, which take place twice a year, and obviously some student excellence awards that are handed out to FE and high HE um, students to support, obviously, development in the local area. Obviously, what we try and encourage people to do is obviously come to events, join a group and involve your company. Obviously, the more companies that we involve, the better events and more uh, visibility for the local engineers in the area can, can benefit from. So I really do encourage people to take part and participate and volunteer where they can. It is a real great benefit especially myself as a young professional engineer, I get lots of visibility and exposure to those things that you necessarily wouldn't do early on in your career. Um, obviously, anyone interested in those opportunities can talk, contact myself. Um, Michael Gilbert's second email there, obviously, Andrew Caldos, the, the group chair, his emails there are, are, are for the m, m group, and obviously, Godfrey Evans, who will be in this presentation today, who's our local network chair as well currently. Um, so please do reach out if you're interested. Um, obviously, today's event is green surface engineering, obviously the importance of coping technologies to preserve global resources, and um, joint event with Surface Engineering Association and Surface Engineering Protection Limited. We have Dave Elliott, who will be speaking first, and then obviously followed by Godfrey Evans. Um, 
webinar arrangements will take 35 to 40 minutes, Q&A session, and obviously put your questions in the box and we'll go through them at the end. And obviously we'll CPD certificates are on request. Obviously, please reach out and I'll go over this at the end as well for everyone. Obviously, we have a future event as well, which is advanced healthcare applications in optical 3D metrology. So what I'm going to do is finish there for now. And I'm going to hand over to Dave, so I'll stop the share as well. And um, I'll pop this slide up at the end as well for everyone so you can see what's going on. But for now, I'll hand over to Dave. Thank you very much. OK, thank you for that. I'm now going to share my screen um, and get my presentation ready. So, um, Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Dave Elliott from the Surface Engineering Association. We're a UK-based trade association representing the whole of the surface engineering sector. And we're based in the Jewelry Quarter in Birmingham. You might wonder why we're in the Jewelry Quarter. Well, it's historic reasons, because that's where electroplating was first commercialised in the UK. And this year is our 135th uh, anniversary. But believe it or not, it's one of the most uncertain times for our members uh, for many, many years uh, with everything that's going on, particularly with the energy prices at the moment. Um, but there are some very, very exciting opportunities, uh, particularly regarding the journey to uh, net zero. Now, here's a quick overview of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to come out of the presentation in a minute and show you a couple of videos. Uh, I did try to embed them into the uh, presentation, but my computer said no. So I'm going to come out of this, show you the two videos. Then just a quick slide on what I believe green surface engineering is. Then look at some typical applications. Um, and then I'll hand over to Godfrey, who will go through some um, actual examples. So I'm now going to jump out of the, um, the presentation and then show you, hopefully, a couple of videos. Let's start with this one here. Our world is full of innovations. Some are simple, some complex. Some get here soon, while others take longer to arrive. But have you ever wondered why things really weren't? The things we use every day. The things that connect us. And shape our world. things we are passionate about that give life and make us dream. Here's the thing. All of these are part of our everyday lives. They all have surfaces that serve a purpose, make them work. Surfaces come in different shapes, sizes, and properties. Some are decorative, some functional, some are visible, while others are hidden. For us, surfaces are the core of what we're all about. We are passionate about surface finishing solutions. Our chemical solutions are indispensable to enhance durability and improve appearance, create electrical conductivity and functionality. We make things work, look good, and last longer. Whether as a final product or a key electronics component, Today, it is almost impossible to imagine life without smartphones. These complex devices have redefined how we interact with the world. And behind visible surfaces, there's a hidden world of surfaces that make it work. From microprocessors to chip carriers and printed circuit boards, our electroplating technologies are used in virtually every component of the modern smartphone. The combination of our wet chemical process and equipment technologies is used to create the electrical conductivity and interconnection needed to make devices work and enable all functionalities users demand, from increasing processing speeds, managing higher data volumes, 
two ever smaller devices. A mid-sized car today contains over 10,000 parts. Many of these parts are treated with our decorative and functional surface finishing solutions. In the world of automobiles, functionality and design are key. As a partner to this industry, we help to drive design decisions, durability standards, enable electrification and autonomous driving. Our leading surface finishing solutions are the result of continuous research and development and based on years of experience with a strong focus on the requirements of the automotive industry. Customized surface finishing solutions facilitate new design opportunities and provide ideal functionality, all the while meeting and exceeding automotive industry standards. We create surfaces, complex and innovative, decorative or functional, mission critical and life enhancing every day, now and in the future. Autotech, a global leader in surface finishing solutions. So that was a presentation from one of our, our members um, uh, who supply, as you should see their chemistry. And now I'm just going to show you another little video that shows you that surface engineering is everywhere. Um, hopefully this one will load up now. Here we go. So hopefully that sort of set the scene and given you um, an idea of different uh, surface engineering applications. Now, this is what uh, one member of parliament thought surface engineering was when he came along to one of our briefing luncheons. And I suppose it is a form of surface engineering, but it's not really in the context of what we're going to talk about today. So what, what is surface engineering? Well, it refers to a wide range of technologies designed to modify the surface properties of metallic and non-metallic components for specific and sometimes unique engineering purposes. And what we need to remember is that almost all manufactured items have had their surfaces engineered in one way or another. What is green surface engineering. Some people just say, oh, green, that means we have to, we can't use any hazardous substances. But the, to be a true green coating, a green surface engineered component, 
you need to look at all of these aspects here. You need to consider that, yes, we need to dec decrease the amount of pollution. We need to minimize the exposure to pet potential hazards. And that's both human health and the environment. We certainly need to improve the use of raw materials and energy, but throughout the life cycle of the product, not just the surface engineering process. And another factor that's extremely important, we need to maintain economic efficiency and viability. It's no good having a coating that's classed as green, but but um, it cannot be produced or it's 50 times more expensive of what we're using. It uses a lot more energy. We need to take all of these four factors into consideration before we can class something as being a green surface engineering. Now, surface engineering, the perception is that we're dirty, polluting industry, but we've come a really long way since that photograph was taken and when i first started when i in service engineering when i left school um i can remember conditions like that but today this is what many of the um, service engineering companies look like state-of-the-art world-class facilities they're not all there we are working on that but this is typical of the new types of installations that are going in. Here's a quick overview of some of the surface engineering coatings, uh, what we cover with surface engineering, anodizing, carburizing, case hardening, all sorts of different types of coatings, as you can see uh, on the screen there. Um, some of the more newer and exciting ones are in thin, thin film deposition. Um, physical vapor deposition, and I'll come on to um, a couple of those. But let's have a look at, um, at some examples of surface engineering that can be classed as green. Now, you've probably all experienced trying to get that last bit of source out of the bottle. Um, well, scientists in Boston have now found a way of making sure you can get every last drop of ketchup out of the bottle. They've developed a coating that makes bottle interiors super slippy. And the coating is used to make it easier to squeeze the contents out of other containers. So those holding toothpaste, cosmetics, glue, etc. And the researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology believe that their innovation could dramatically reduce waste. So surface engineering is environmentally friendly because it can significantly reduce waste. Now in the video, um, the first video I showed you, we saw um, a typical car and it was showing you some, some of the areas where coatings are used. Now, one of the key developments in making um, automotive or driving more environmentally friendly is weight reduction. So reducing the weight, which improves the fuel efficiency. There are weight reduction coatings um, on aluminium engine blocks, magnesium components. We can also use uh, plastic based uh, components, which then have a decorative coating applied to them. Also, the life expectancy of automobiles has increased tremendously over the years. And a lot of that is to do with the corrosion protection um, that's imparted by various coatings on shock absorbers, brake pistons, fasteners, brake calipers, and then wear resistance coatings as well on the steering racks, fuel injection components and clutch assemblies. We then have the electronics, the coatings that help with the electronics for the display technology, ABS, SatNav, and electronic transmission control. And in fact, there's over 10,000 components in the modern day car that rely on surface engineering to function correctly. 
So surface engineering keeps the world moving. Now, I don't know if anybody um, saw a recent news item that the um, NSG Pilkington site, the glass site in St. Helens, they ran their glass making furnace recently on 100% of biofuel. So that's one area in which glass is becoming green. And there have been many exciting developments in the coating of glass. And this is just one um, coating uh, technique that is currently in use on glass. And it's a type of, of sputtering um, where glass sheets um, are uh, the size is about six meters by 3.3 meters. The glass sheets are passed through a, a vacuum. Um, they travel along through vacuum chambers and they are bombarded um, and material is sputtered, layered onto the surfaces. And there's multiple chambers which can then produce complex multi-layers. Uh, it's a semi-continuous process because obviously it's not, con not continuous and directly from the glass production. But this is a quick overview here, um, which depicts the type of coatings that you can get. And on the left-hand side, we have a depiction of a low um, emissivity coating, which will prevent heat loss. Um, can be made of up to 12 layers but those layers are only 80 nanometers in thickness and a six meter by 3.3 meter um, glass sheet can be coated in 45 seconds. On the right we've got what they call a, a solar control uh, coating which has a double layer of silver and then it can have up to 20 layers uh, but will still that will still only add 100 nanometers. And there, that will take about 90 seconds to process that particular uh, glass sheet. Now, there's a lot of opportunity in it, new opportunities, but also existing coatings. And I've just listed a few here. So on the passive side, we've got coatings on glass that will self-clean, manage energy, control light, can be antimicrobial, anti-pollution, photochromatic. And then what you can have is called dynamic. So you can actually switch the light transmission. As you can see um, on the little diagram on the right-hand side, you can have the glass in the transmissive state, or you can have it in the reflexive state. So the glass is clear, but then it becomes colored and um, reflects the light. Can, digital signage, digital connectivity, or what we call smart capability is being developed, and also building integrated photovoltaics into glass. So there's a lot of exciting developments going on with glass at the moment. Bearings, if you, if you think where bearings are used um, today, um, almost a lot of applications for uh, green energy generation rely on bearings and there are a number of coatings that are currently being used um, for the bearings depending on the operating conditions so if you apply a coating or a combination of coatings to the base material of the bearing you can extend the operating life of that particular bearing so where you have wear and fretting corrosion, we can use a zinc iron or zinc nickel alloy coating. For reduced frictions, the coatings which are impregnated with PTFE. For insulation, you can use oxide ceramic coatings and the uh, photo on, on the left-hand side at the bottom is of a, a bearing with oxide ceramic coating on. And for high tri tribological stresses with lubricant starvation, you can use various carbon-based um, coatings. Now, how many times have you got your mobile phone wet 
and that's the end of it you have to throw it away so much waste um goes on with mobile phones but most of the recently released mobile phones have been treated so that they are now have a certain degree of, of waterproofness um a company called p2i uh, have painted a technology which employs a special plasma coating which is created in a vacuum chamber and it attaches nanometer thin polymer coating over the entire surface of the product so this process dramatically reduces the surface energy of the product so that when liquid comes into contact with it they form tiny beads and simply run off i wouldn't recommend testing it out by dunking your phone in, in a beaker full of water but it certainly protects the, the, um, the mobile phones from um, accidental uh, water damage now some people might think that um, air travel is not green um, but i think air travel has become uh, a necessity uh, to, to some respect and so we need to make air travel as environmentally friendly and efficient as possible and that often means operating at elevated temperatures now a birmingham based company called indestructible paints have developed numerous coatings uh, as you can see from the slide here it identifies where their coatings are used and they allow aero engines to operate at elevated temperatures and become significantly more fuel efficient all of the coatings that have been specifically developed um, for high temperature usage and some of them will operate up to uh, 850 degrees centigrade some of them have been specifically developed for particular chemical or erosion resistance now i mentioned bearings earlier well wind turbines operate under extreme conditions that put components under considerable wear for example the turbine um, shaft bearings planetary gears and rotating shafts must perform under very high loads which include direct metal on metal contact and typically have <laughs> less than ideal lubrication so components that are made of hardened steel or metal alloys can break down from scuffing, surface fatigue, pitting, galling, and overall wear and tear. And one way to prolong the component life is to use specialized coatings and surface treatments um, on the components. Two such treatments that are in common use are physical vapor deposition, or PVD for short, and nitriding a type of heat treatment process that's found to significantly increase the durability and lifespan on wind turbine components. Now also, there are specialized coatings that are on those um, turbine blades that, uh, that you can see there. Um, just imagine those blades spinning around um, and the amount of debris that can build up on the edge of the blade well they are coated um, in special material which basically is a self-cleaning material to keep them complete completely clean now we've all heard that the purchase of new diesel petrol and hybrid cars um, is going to be banned in the uk just around the corner well a coating that will improve the lifetime of life lightweight lithium batteries and make them more stable has been created by researchers from Stanford University in the US. Lithium metal batteries can hold approximately a third more power per half kilo than lithium ion batteries. Um, as well as being lighter because the anode is made of lithium rather than graphite, this makes the lithium metal battery a preferred option for most uh, electronic devices. But the hurdle is making the batteries more reliable. Well, to do this, the research team developed the dynamic single ion conductive network, 
which is a polymer coating that actively prohibits what's called dendrites from forming, which would lead um, to overheating and the batteries exploding. So another example of green surface engineering. Now, the term, there's another term as well as green coatings. There are smart coatings and smart coat, the term smart coating refers to the concept of coatings being able to sense their environment and make an appropriate response to that particular stimulus. So examples of smart coating include stimuli, stimuli responsive antimicrobial, anti-fouling, conductive, self-healing, and super hydrophobic systems. Just imagine what if a bearing could be coated and the coating itself monitor the amount of wear that is taking place and then report that back. The possibilities are endless and these coatings are all being developed here in the UK. So it's a really exciting time for the Surface Engineering Association. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll now hand over to my colleague, uh, Godfrey Evans. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, very interesting presentation. Um, and hopefully um, the, the phrase of, well, follow that uh, doesn't prove too difficult. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, um, I've worked in surface engineering on the um, on the coal faces, if you like. Um, Twenty nine years um, working in and managing a company called Swinton Electro Plating in various guises. My background uh, is predominantly hard chrome plating and electroless nickel, so we're covering for. Uh, wear resistance and corrosion resistance. Um, and I just want to show you some examples of um, the type of work that's that's been done at Swinton, um, but is also available, obviously, in many more places. Um, and then I'll run on to an example of um, how and why uh, this can be considered as a green technology. Okay, so I'll just share my screen. And hopefully, go. So the company was established in 1962 and it repaired musical instruments initially. Um, changed in 1968 uh, um, to industrial okay. Yep. So if you to drop, your screen's not sharing. Oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. That's it now. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's uh, let's just go back then. Sorry. So apologies for that. Uh, yeah. So after 29 years in the plating industry, um, I now formed a, a new company, Surface Engineering Protection Limited, um, and that's got a double uh, double meaning. Um, in that surface engineering does give protection to uh, many different components, but also I'm working to help to protect the industry itself. So the original company was established in 1962, Belmont Musical Instruments, as the name suggests, it was trombones and trumpets, and then swiftly moved on to industrial coatings and starting with uh, hard chrome plating. Uh, this is used extensively in uh, all different types of machine components. Um, as the name suggests, it's very hard. Um, it's long lasting in terms of abrasive wear uh, and can be used for many, many different things. So Swinton specialized, as I say, in hard chrome and electroless nickel uh, and pedigree extended uh, shortly after I joined uh, to include um, what we call mud rotors, 
you know, this is this is a piece of equipment. It's it's the prime mover for the drill bit on oil and gas rigs. Um, so, in 1993, uh, we managed um, to produce ten new rotors a week. Um, as the business um, increased, as the oil price went up. Uh, for obvious reasons, the company started exploring more and more, and the the volumes increased. So we're looking at twenty five a week for four years later, um, another three years, and we're up to forty five. And then two thousand and eight, we peaked at sixty rotors a week. Um, in nineteen ninety two. We were refurbishing rotors. So, in other words, we were taking used rotors, taking the original chrome plating off and replacing it so they could go back out into service uh, and to be used again. So, 1992, as I say, average one rotor per month and it was busy. Uh, and as you can see, uh, the progression um, went from one per month to 30 per month by the year 2000. Um, in 2001, we added additional capacity in terms of chrome plating to cope with the increased volumes. And we also increased the length available. Uh, and this is a, a picture of what was then uh, the longest rotor ever manufactured in the world. Now, these things are uh, milled and polished from a solid stainless steel bar. The capacity also allowed us to do many different things. Uh, the picture on the left is a hydraulic piston rod, um, just under nine meters long. Um, and then you've got pump rotors, which are um, piece of equipment that go into the hole after it's been drilled on land for um, oil. Uh, and this is what's called the recovery pump. Um, so in other words, this is the, this is the beast that uh, pumps the oil up to the surface for further uh, shipment onto the refiners and ultimately use in many different things. Star Wars really um, wasn't part of our uh, portfolio, um, although this does distinctly look like something from it. Uh, it's actually a ball valve. Uh, again, oil and gas lines in particular, um, chemical plants. Um, and this smooth surface is laid down onto a um, high percentage nickel um, casting which in its own right would wear away very, very quickly. Um, the coating that's applied is between 25 and 50 microns. That's one to two thousandths of an inch for the older um, viewers. Um, and that's sufficient to make this ball valve last for many, many years by comparison to a few hours in the uncoated condition. The electrolysis nickel process, um, mainly for corrosion resistance, again, um, is something that is very, very um, environmentally typical. Um, and as you can see, this gray tube is actually this piece uh, that was coated internally. Uh, and just to put it into context, you can see the, the people standing below looking up to this unit. Um, this unit is something like 17 metres tall uh, and is actually still installed in the Orkneys in the um, Marine Test Centre uh, and is a wave generator. So the electrolysis nickel in the cylinder is protecting the cylinder to allow it to continue to operate, which then allows the wave generator to pump water through and 
drive a turbine which provides energy so the green energy that comes from wave energy is actually being supported by surface engineering uh, to protect its long-term viability but we use it for many different things um, this is an example of an off-road motorcycle um, as you can imagine going through mud and water and um, flying rocks uh, very very prone to damage and corrosion um, so this this would be where it would benefit from electrolysis nickel and then we've got a pipeline strainer um, so again this is uh, typically in the an oil application um, and it will strain out uh, any rocks or debris that's flowing through the, the pipelines before it actually hits any valve work or any other um, sensitive inf uh, equipment. Now, what you've seen so far is all industrial um, and salvaging work. This again looks industrial, but in actual fact, it's for a food application. So the pictures on the left, um, I would imagine you like uh, everyone else in the world, me included, would be very reluctant to eat anything that was produced from it in that rusty, horrible, um, attacked condition. But the finished article on the right is something that you would like to um, display uh, in the best kitchens in the world. Um, and this, again, um, allows it to function. It allows it to have a, a longer lifetime. Um, and it is a food grade coating, which um, obviously protects the health of um, us as uh, consumers. Now, there are many different ap applications for uh, these coatings. Uh, and this is just a, a few examples. Um, the the uh, the roller. Um, just give me a second. The roller on the bottom right um, is actually hard chrome plated and is a part of a production line for um, zinc plated steel strip. Um, and it's a part of the tension arrangement that that goes through that. So it's got to be very rough in order to drive the steel strip, um, but it's also got to be very hard wearing, uh, as you appreciate, because the steel is, is trying to uh, stop the roller from turning. These bearing units uh, are what you saw indicated on the uh, second video that Dave uh, shared with us. Uh, and it's a swivel bearing unit that um, fits to the, carriage bogies on um, train carriages. Um, the Pendolino train is a typical example of this. Um, and for those who don't know, the Pendolino train um, actually tilts on its suspension as it goes round corners. Now this, this allows that train to travel in excess of 100 miles an hour. Um, if these bearings were not fitted, in other words, if it was a standard carriage uh, bogey suspension, that speed round bends will be restricted to probably less than 60 miles an hour because of the in inertial force. So it allows a faster and more efficient journey to take place simply because of a very small chrome plated surface. And then these pictures on the left, this is a, um, a chrome plated uh, cylinder, uh, which is used for paint mixing. Uh, so it's chrome plated on the inside. And this piece here is actually a part of um, what was designed as a non-magnetic um, scuba diving regulator. Uh, now this is a military application and it's non-magnetic non for one very, very important reason. 
And that is when the diver goes down to neutralize a mine um, out in the open sea, most of them are fitted not only with contacts, but also with magnetic sensors. So if they go anywhere near it with anything that is remotely magnetic, then it's time to say goodbye. Um, so these, these are coated for corrosion protection, but also to protect the users um, in terms of being non-magnetic. So these are just a few examples of um, the work that uh, is done, not only at Swinton, as I say, there's, there's uh, many different plating companies around the UK and the world. Um, what we tend to like to do is a good job and to have a really nice day. In doing what we do, um, it's very rare that we ever see the full effect of the, the coating. Um, and very rare that we see the full assembly. So it's, it's nice to be able to be involved in um, what ultimately happens. And this um, is just a, a short video of um, the reasons why um, I like to go to work. We've all seen increasing numbers of flood events. England's east coast also suffers from tidal events. The Environment Agency commissioned a tidal barrier as part of flood defence works. Lots of engineering work is necessary and is also vital for it to work when it is needed. Hydraulic cylinders power the barrier into its open or closed position. Cylinders are built using materials able to cope with the massive loads without failing. But piston rod is open to the elements, brackish water and air, until the barrier has to close. Hard chrome coating is used to prevent corrosion and provide low friction. Oh, the specification is a 15-year minimal maintenance design life. Surface engineered coatings may seem a simple part of these major projects. The process itself involves some very careful handling and accurate control. Without the chrome, the cylinder would corrode and seize, risking flood and devastation. With the chrome, the cylinders will work, last longer and look nice. So that just gives you a flavour of um, what uh, chrome plating is capable of doing and, and uh, the sort of assistance it gives to um, our daily lives. And this picture on the screen now, um, believe it or not, is a good example of wear and corrosion resistance. This is a, um, a mud rotor uh, as uh, discussed in the, in the earlier slides, uh, and yes, it's been used. Um, this was down a, um, an oil well uh, and in operation for approximately 30 hours. And what you see basically is the chrome surface um, that has, has been corroded, um, but it's a surface which can be replaced. So it can be refurbished and put back to its original condition. So the design life of a piece basically equates to environmental protection. One of the things that uh, we have to remember as engineers um, is that uh, the fundamental task of Iron, which is the main constituent of all steels, is to revert back to its original condition, which is iron oxide, or as commonly called, rust. So we as engineers design uh, machines and equipment to the best of our abilities to function, 
but we also have to take into account how long it's going to function for, or how long it needs to function for, hence the environmental protection. If we don't provide enough design life, then we have to replace the parts. Um, and some of those parts are very intricate, very long and very costly. The rotor on the uh, top left, just as an example, manufacturing, sorry, uh, sales cost of that piece as a spare part is in excess of $100,000. If it were to fail prematurely, then it's the same amount again. However, we at Swinton Electrical Plating coated these things with hard chrome plate, and um, we were doing on average 2,000 pieces per year. Now it operates in a condition at the drill face. So that small piece of work, nearly nine meters long, actually represents a very, very small amount of the um, equipment that's drilling for oil. And this illustration actually is ideal um, in that there is one of these oil rig drilling platforms based on the island off Pool Harbour called Brown Sea Island. And up until the late 1990s, it, it held the record for the um, longest point from the point of entry. So in other words, the drill bit entered at this position um, on land, went down and then directionally horizontal. And the total distance covered was 21.75 kilometers. And each of those um, kilometers or meters is achieved by screwing pieces of pipe together, which are 15 meters long. So as you can imagine, if the, the, uh, the rotor fails in service, there's an awful lot of 15 meter pipes to remove to get that 21 and three quarter kilometer drill bit back to the surface to change. So it's critical that it lasts for as long as possible. It's also critical that it lasts for as many uses as possible. So the coating that we apply, as Dave suggested, there are some chemicals that we use that some people consider to be environmentally unfriendly. Um, and one that springs to mind from many years ago that you'll probably all remember is Erin Brockovich. She campaigned against the use of uh, what's called hexavalent chrome, um, but that was because it contaminated a water source in its chemical form. As electroplaters, we actually use it to apply a coating. And once the coating's on, it's chromium metal. So there is nothing uh, detrimental to the environment to use any piece of equipment that's hard chrome plated. In fact, um, decorative chrome is pretty much the same material. And you will see that on cooking implements, on the wire racks in uh, your domestic oven, many other places, including um, the local burger uh, house that you might visit, um, where the cooking plate, the hot plate that the burgers sit on, is actually hard chrome plated to protect it from the operators with the metal scrapers. Uh, so it's completely inert and it's um, food friendly. Okay, so just a worked example of uh, the contributions to the environment that um, hard chrome plating makes. And I've translated this into the, the cost in terms of kilograms of CO2 rather than pounds and pennies. So we start off with a steel um, 
billet and the carbon cost to produce the steel will be 2,890 kilograms of CO2. Then we have to machine it from that solid piece to the um, twisted rotor section that you've seen, and that takes 210 kilos of CO2. And then to hard ground plate it, there's another 232. So in total, we're looking at 3,332 kilos of carbon dioxide to manufacture that one rotor, which is not a small amount. Um, but in terms of environmental sustainability, what we've got is a comparison of a new rotor costs us 3,332 kilos. We then refurbish it and including removing the chrome that's been damaged, um, reconditioning the surface to allow it to uh, be re-hard re chrome plated and also re chrome plated, we use a total of 303 kilograms of CO2. So as you can see, that's 10%, actually less than 10% of um, the initial cost, saving of over 3000 kilos. Now these rotors are eminently reworkable more than one time. So each and every time it's refurbished, not only does it save 3000 kilos of CO2, it also saves 600 kilos of raw material. And obviously the bigger rotor, the more material it, it would save. So we're saving the resources of the planet and per year, on the bank basis of the example of 2,000 rotors a week, uh, a year, um, we're saving 6,058 tonnes of CO2 and 1,200 tonnes of steel. And this is just for one small application. There are many, many more um, pieces that have been plated over the years at Swinton. Uh, and Swinton is one, just one of many chrome plates in the UK and many, many chrome plates in the world. Using a, a process that can be deemed to be um, environmentally unfriendly by those with a vested interest in getting rid of chemicals, but in actual fact it's producing a metallic surface which is environmentally very friendly. So we've got environmental protection and sustainability all as a part of our daily lives. So thank you for listening. Um, and at this point, uh, I'll hand back to our host, Mike Gilbert, um, and we can take any questions. Hello, everyone. Um, so we've just got a couple of questions today. Um, the first being uh, for Godfrey. Uh, that is from Tony. What techniques do you use for masking areas slash maybe internals where you don't wish to deposit a coating? Sorry, Michael, can you repeat that? It says, what techniques do you use for masking areas, maybe internals where you, do, you, where you don't wish to deposit the coating? Um, well, there's various uh, various methods of doing it. The ideal way uh, would be to block off the internals. Um, so I put uh, sealing caps uh, on each end uh, and simply plate the outside. Um, or you can use various masking materials, whether that be um, PVC, um, rigid PVC, or masking tapes. Um, so. Um, and the old, old standard method would be to coat it in a, a wax uh, material, uh, which can then be removed after it's been plated. Right. Hopefully that answers your question, Tony. Um, but yeah, moving on, the next one was, uh, to what extent does surface engineering, particularly of plastics, um, and then it says, 
metal metalized polymers used in lightweight cars or hydrophobic coatings of ketchup bottles, for instance, impact on the recyclability of materials or the maturity purity of materials after recycling? What is the potential to improve this? Is that a question for Dave, I think? Yeah, I'll come in and, and those who are observant will notice I've had a quick change because I'm on the subs bench tonight, um, the game against Man City. Um, yeah, a very good question that. Um, if you look at the metallic coatings that go on to uh, the various polymers that are used in the automotive sector, the metallic coating can actually be completely removed um, from the surface, which will allow then recyclability of, of the plastic component. There are issues, I, I, I admit, with um, some of the hydrophobic coatings that are applied um, to, to some plastics, which do lead to issues with recyclability. Um, there is a couple of research projects on at the moment looking at that to see um, whether the coatings can be then separated prior to recycling. But at the moment, yes, it is an issue and it is something that does need further investigation. Okay, perfect. Hopefully that answers your question for you, Rupert. Uh, one final question, uh, again from Tony. If one is reclaiming a worn steel part by hard chrome plating, and finally grinding. What is the optimum surface on the old part for the plastic, for the plating process to commence? Uh, well, obviously, uh, if you finish into a, a size and a surface finish, um, then ideally you want the surface finish, which is approximately the same as what's um, what you end up with um, but with a, a, a repair as, as you've described um, you can actually use um, a, a rough fairly roughly machined finish because at the end of the day what you're applying is a coating which then is finished machined back to size and surface condition there is a fine balance to, to strike though with that in that the rougher the surface, then the more probability there is of imperfections. And it's almost like, um, I mean, hopefully we all understand the context of uh, beer in a glass and the, the froth on the top. Um, the, the, the form on the top is generated from uh, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide in the beer uh, that comes out of solution and forms the head. What you also see when you sat having a chat um, and the glass is sat in front of you is there's bubbles that are uh, coming up the side of the glass all the time. Now what's happening there is it's an imperfection on the surface which acts as a, um, a catch point for the very, very minute bubbles of gas that's in the, um, in the beer. And those bubbles build to the point where they're too big to be held by the glass and away they go to the surface. In the plating process, that very same situation can, can occur. So if you've got a rough surface that will hold the bubbles that are generated during the process, then it will likely result in a pinhole in the coating, uh, which could be a reason for rejection and, uh, and replate. So it's a balance. Um, you can do it on a rough surface, but sensibly you want to be as good a surface as possible. Okay, thank you for that, um, Godfrey. And hopefully that answers your question, Tony. And um, we've had another one come in. Is there a coating that can be applied to aluminium used in a subsea application that will provide a really long lasting corrosion resistance? Um, again, with that, it, it depends on the, the ultimate application um, and the conditions that it's operating in. Um, aluminium with an electrolyzed nickel coating um, is a good fit for that scenario. Uh, the electrolyzed nickel being the corrosion protection. Um, 
But if the component is in a severe um, abrasion uh, application, then the electrolysis nickel isn't um, particularly hard and particularly hard wearing. It's better than the aluminium, obviously, uh, but it's not um, fantastic. It is feasible um, to lay hard chrome over the top of electrolysis nickel. Um, and that has been used in, in many uh, submarine applications um, and is used actually in the uh, tensioning piston rods for uh, floating platforms to keep them in, in the stable position. So it does have many uses, but for aluminium, it, it's a very, very difficult one to be specific. Um, and we need to know the, the um, full details of the application. Thank you for that, Godfrey, again. Um, I think um, there's one last one. It's less of a question, more of a fact. Um, we've had someone comment in to say that metalised coatings on plastic can be removed for recycling, but they aren't in normal recycling operations as it's too expensive. Um, so they do make the material uneconomically unrecyclable. Um, so less of, a, less of a question and more of a, an incoming fact. Um, that, that, well, I was. I would agree. I would. I would agree with that comment. It does. It. It does then make them, because of the cost of removing the coating, um, it can make them uneconomical then to recycle. Um, yeah. So, so I think that's all the questions for today, everyone. Um, obviously, thank you to Godfrey and Dave, obviously for the fantastic presentations today. Um, I've put in the, the chat box as well, obviously, the contact details from myself and Andrew Carlos, who can be contacted directly for CPD certificates. Um, so please do reach out if you're in, in, interested in receiving one. Um, I'm, I'm going to move to obviously stop the recording, which will end the presentation today for everyone. Um, but obviously, if you've got any questions or feedback or anything, obviously, you can reach out to the emails provided. Um, and obviously, thank you again, everyone, for attending. Okay. Thanks, Godfrey. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Dave. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks very much for giving okay. us the opportunity to present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.